But welcome to the Friends of Malheur National Wildlife Refuge's first ever virtual Friends Gathering. This afternoon's presentation is Trumpeter Swans of the West with Dr. Gary Ivey. This is just one of many online programs taking place this week during our virtual Friends Gathering. I'll be telling you more about those at the end of Gary's presentation. So who am I? I'm Janelle Wicks. I'm the Executive Director for the Friends of Malheur National Wildlife Refuge. In October, I will have been in this role for two years. I personally love our public lands and I have a special place in my heart for National Wildlife Refuges. A lifetime ago, I worked as a field biologist at Chincoteague National Wildlife Refuge. And once I found myself in Oregon, I was the Environmental Education Specialist for the Klamath Basin Refuges. For, um, for a little bit before I found myself in Malheur. Um, my role here with the Malheur Friends Group is to connect you, our friends and followers, uh, along with the visiting public to the magic of Malheur. This year, 2020, has presented its challenges in making good on this objective. Typically, this and other presentations would be taking place in public here in Harney County, where we can gather and meet new friends and talk about how much we love the refuge and why. Um, I wanted to acknowledge that we're here virtually um, because of the ongoing pandemic and our need to keep ourselves and our community safe. But it's giving us an opportunity to learn and grow and connect in new ways. So thank you all for coming and being a part of it. Gary Ivey is, um, here with us to give the presentation. Gary has his BS in wildlife management from Humboldt State, along with his MS and PhD in wildlife sciences from Oregon State University. He's been working with swans since 1980, when he, as a biologist for Malheur Refuge, he initiated the neck collar migration study um, on our refuge. So Gary's love of, and advocacy for swans and Malheur Refuge continues today. Currently, he is serving as both the board president for the Malheur Friends Group and for the Trumpeter Swan Society, of which the Friends of the Refuge are supporters. Um, so before I th turn things over to Gary, I want to remind people um, to please keep yourself on mute. It will help with the audio and any potential background or feedback. Uh, during the presentation, I will be moderating any question and answer in the chat box. Please feel free to ask questions there. We're going to save the Q&A until the end, unless there's a pressing question that seems like um, maybe a clarification is needed. Um, but yeah, feel free to find that chat box, make sure it's open, and you can uh, interact and ask questions there. The presentation is going to go for about 35-40 uh, minutes. We'll do the question and answer, and then we'll follow up there at the end um, and farewell. So I'm going to go ahead with that and turn things over to Gary. Give me just a second. I've got to figure out how to share my screen from the beginning here. And let me turn on my video. Okay, well, thanks for the introduction, Janelle. Um, I'm Gary Ivey. Oops, I already went ahead. Um, I'm going to talk about swans, mostly in the, the western populations, which are Rocky Mountain birds. There's, there's two other populations, the Rocky Mountain population, the Pacific Coast population, and the interior population. I'll briefly talk about those other two, but really focused on the birds in Oregon and in the Rocky Mountains in the west. I actually started working on trumpeters. I, I was introduced to a pair of trumpeters and several at Malheur Refuge when I was a temporary, a lowly bio, biological technician in 1979 at Malheur Refuge. And I was working on a duck nesting study and had a bunch of study plots. And one of my plots had a swan nest on it, which at that time, because swans are so rare, you know, we didn't mess with a swan nest, we stayed away from that. So anyway, I kind of was intrigued by swans. And then I ended up with a job that I, took so I could get a 
my federal status, I was a technician down in California working on maps for irrigation districts for the river reclamation. I was going insane, so I wrote this study proposal in 1980. Wasn't yet a biologist at Mel here then uh, to start studying the trumpeters because the flock wasn't growing as well. I'll talk about that a little bit today. Uh, but first, for those of you that are new to swans, um, you may be wondering how do you tell the two uh, common or uncommon uh, swans here in North America, the tundra on the right and the trumpeter on the left. And so a little tip, about 80% of the tundra swans have that little yellow teardrop in front of the eye. Not all of them do. Occasionally you'll see trumpeters with a yellow wash there in front of the eye, but not quite as distinct as on a tundra. Trumpeters tend to have that little red lining along the bill. And what I really focus on is the head shape, which is a lot more angular on a trumpeter, which you'll see in some of these other photos I'll show real quick, as opposed to a very round, rounded head on a tundra swan. And so, and the other thing I really look for is um, the eye on a, tr a tundra looks independent from the mask and the eye on a trumpeter tends to join the mask. So you can see this wide area of the mask up to the eye and this real narrow area. So. Just a couple quick shots here. Um, my control, there we go. One other thing I look for, if you want to be certain, a little more certain, and this isn't com completely reliable, but pretty reliable as trumpeters, if you look at them head on, tend to have a V in front of the eyes, and it's more of a U for trumpet by time response. Um, so here, you, this is your self test. What are these? Did you know all those tips now? Actually, what we have here, you can see this much longer neck and the bird in the back on the left is a trumpeter swan. It's got that mask back in there where the eye doesn't look steep and we have a tundra, a tundra in the front with a much shorter neck and a more distinct eye. So on the left, what do we have? You can see that distinct eye on those two tundra swans there and this on the right, we have a flock of, um, what are they? They're tundra swans, right? So the eye is pretty distinct. And here's some typical trumpeters with the, the eye looking like it's part of the mask and that very angular head. So what are these? Last, this is your last quiz. If you said tundra swans, you got it down. Okay, let's, let's talk about history. This is a, a map that was done in Winston Banco's monograph on trumpeter swans in 1960. It shows what he, what he could figure out as the historic distribution, breeding distribution of trumpeter swans in North America. And talking to Winston, he said he didn't feel this was a complete effort. And, and since this was published, there's been other records of breeding trumpeters further along the East Coast. And if you look at Oregon, where I've been working my whole career, um, it didn't show them historically breeding. However, uh, there is a 1922 record in May in the Bloodson Valley of a single trumpeter, adult trumpeter swan. And there's a couple other early 20th century records of trumpeters in Oregon and other areas that suggest they were breeding birds around. Those trumpeters wouldn't be off by themselves somewhere. They would be around some breeding area during that sun the summertime as we're seeing. So also, some of you know who this guy is, is John Muir. He talks about his favorite birds of the Yosemite, uh, Sierra in California. And he mentions the, the trumpet and the swan in one of his uh, journals. And another thing that intrigued me, he reports in, on June 23rd, 1853, he was on the east side of the Sierras down at Mono Lake, which is a big salt flat now, salt playa lake. Um, it's very important to a lot of wa uh, water birds, but um, he's, he reported a raft of swans in June 1853 on Mono Lake at the estuary where the creek flew and he called it an estuary. And, uh, at that time of year, you would not have tundra swans, which nest up in the Arctic down in the state. So that suggests that there's, I would suspect those were breeding, uh, non-breeding trumpeters. They don't nest until they're five or six years old. So you have these, when you have healthy trumpeters breeding, you have a, a large non-breeding segment roaming around. And that would suggest they were as far south as California in the breeding season. I'm gonna talk mostly about Malheur records in the history of that flock. Uh, this is a, a Google Earth shot of now here lake, which is when it's full, it's about 50 to 60,000 acre marsh. It's, it's a shallow freshwater marsh, very important for a lot of water bird species and waterfowl. And, uh, the refuge itself is 187,000 acres. 
beautiful place. Um, going back at the, uh, where you see this blue highway in the middle, that little narrow stretch between Mud Lake and Malheur Lake is called the Narrows. It used to be an old town there. These people lived in that town back in the 1800s, 1860s, 1870s. And it was there for market hunting because all these birds would fly across the narrows. And this is one family. Uh, the, the caption of this is something about um, this family was responsible for the, mostly responsible for the established amount of refuge, which is actually true to a degree because they were also it was established because of the egret harvesting for those plumes. But um, anyway, a lot of trumpeters were shot by market hunters. They were packing the meat up and selling it on the west side. And um, they shot a lot of birds, obviously. I don't think too many of these are trumpeters, but there could be a couple in there. Another historic issue, <clears throat> the Hudson Bay Company, which most of you probably know was famous for fur trapping and trading, you know, beaver pelts and fox and coyote and wolf and all kinds of skins were shipped to Europe and, and sold in North America for people's clothing and so forth. Another big trade deal that they did, that they, they traded swan, swan skins. You know, the feathers of a trumpeter swan, uh, John James Audubon reported that it was his favorite writing quill as a trumpeter swan um, primary. But the main value in the feathers was really the skin with the down on it. You take all the body feathers off, and they probably didn't sell those, but some people probably use it for bedding. But it was the skin with the down on it. And if you think about that, what would that make? If they would tan that as leather, and that was used for powder puffs for makeup. So all the powdered wigs that George Washington wore, and a lot of people in Europe, I mean, there was a huge market for swan skins as well. And there was one report of, of in one shipment, 17,000 skins going out getting to Europe in one of these uh, facilities. So Hudson Bay Company had a big impact. The result of all that market hunting and, and uh, not just market hunting, a lot of the settlers were hungry people on, on the prairies and on the uh, Intermountain West and they ate what they could shoot. And a lot of the gold miners that came to California were very hungry and shot everything. And, so I think that had a big impact. But by 1932, at least in the lower 48, it was only known to be 69 surviving based on a survey in 1932 by the uh, Park Service. And so it was between uh, Centennial Valley and Montana, which was later part of it was established as Red Rock Lakes National Wildlife Refuge to protect the swans. But there, there, uh, there were also uh, birds that survived in uh, Yellowstone National Park. So only 69 left. However, um, I guess the Americans didn't talk to the Canadians very well because 1918, there were 78 trumpeters still present in Grand Prairie, Alberta. The, both the Yellowstone uh, region and the uh, Alberta region are Rocky Mountain population trumpeter swans. And after Alaska became a state shortly afterwards, um, trumpeters were discovered to breed, be breeding there. And when they first counted them in 1920, uh, 1968, they got almost 2,000 trumpeters. And that, that group is, is what's become the Pacific Coast population. Later, I'm not going to talk about this in detail, but the interior population, which spans from Iowa to Ontario and most of the Great Lakes states and, and um, Minnesota, I, I'm not going to mention them all, but um, Wisconsin, that all started from work beginning in the 60s, but really um, a, a lot of effort in the 80s and 90s to kind of mix these two flocks. Originally, they started out with, with uh, Rocky Mountain genetic stock, and then eventually they got eggs from Alaska, and they built the, the interior population in the Midwest. So when, when they found the birds at Red Rock Lakes Refuge, um, they didn't want all the, their swan eggs in one basket. So soon after that, the Bureau of Biological Survey, which is now the Fish and Wildlife Service, um, started moving trumpeter swans around the landscapes, starting out slow. And the first site they chose was Malheur Refuge. And I, I call these the legacy flocks. I forgot to put the Elk Refuge, which is in Wyoming on here as well, but it's so close to Yellowstone. Um, it's not really a separate group so much, but um, Malheur Refuge uh, in Eastern Oregon, Turnbull Refuge is up in North uh, or Southeast uh, Washington. Ruby Lake is in northeast Nevada, and La Creek Refuge in, in South Dakota where the release sites. They, they, they release birds at these sites from stock at Red Rock Lakes Refuge uh, through the mid-60s. The last releases at Malheur, I think, were in the early 50s. 
and I want to point out and mention this because this is the theme, these birds are very isolated. They were released, they were fed, they didn't want to lose any birds so they, to keep their survival up. They fed them grain all winter and, and some of these sites they chose were pretty harsh in the winter, not where a typical wild swan would want to spend the winter, but because they were fed, they, they learned to stay there and they basically imprint on their first wintering areas and continue that tradition which they teach their young. So um, we've had a great success and this Trumpeter Swan Society, which was established in the 60s, has been involved in, in all these restoration programs at some level over the years and, and has shared the science and promoted Trumpeter Swan conservation. But um, the last uh, full-blown Trumpeter Swan survey counted almost 63,000 with uh, the Pacific Coast population, which nests mostly in Alaska and Yukon and northern BC, uh, about 25,000 birds. The interior population, which is all from mostly state and provincial efforts, uh, the Ontario Project is a group of citizens that got the birds going in Ontario in more recent years. Uh, but those are all state run programs pretty much with, with partners, including the Swan Society and a lot of those. Uh, but they're, they're up to almost 27,000. The Rocky Mountain population, about 12,000. And most of those birds in the Rocky Mountain population are in Alberta and eastern British Columbia and up into the Yukon. There's kind of a fuzzy genetic line. You can see the dashed line there between the Pacific Coast and the Rocky Mountain, where there seems to be some hybridization between the two forms or two different haplotypes of uh, genetics. But I want to point out below the, the um, international boundary in the, in the lower 48 states for the Rocky Mountain flock. We've only, um, they only counted 765 trumpeter swans, and that's the adults, those counts. Um, that's not a healthy number uh, for such a large landscape, and uh, I'll talk more about that. But this is showing the trends, uh, this line and, and uh, for the Rocky Mountain, and the, the overall line is this black line, but this green line shows a trend in, in Canada. Rocky Mountain Canada and the slope has showed an increase from this survey 961 a year. The U.S. flocks are increasing about six per year. Not a very good um, result. We've done a little better in more recent years. Last year they counted just under a thousand adults in, in this flock, these flocks, but uh, still have a long way to go to have a healthy um, western states Rocky Mountain population flock. So I'm going to focus on a little bit of the Malheur story, since that's what I've been involved in for much of my life. Malheur is a beautiful place. If you haven't been there, you're missing out after one May, and it's wonderful diversity. You'll add a lot of birds to your list. It's just fantastic. Um, historically, there were 29 sites, different ponds and wetlands that uh, trumpeters were documented nesting in the refuge. This uh, shows basically the curve of swans. They started nesting in the mid-50s, first found nesting, and the population grew until the early 80s, and we peaked from the fall counts at least, uh, 55 in uh, 1984, I believe. Uh, and then it, uh, we had this huge flood in Maynard Mountain West uh, in the early 80s, where the water in Malheur Lake rose 17 feet, and Malheur also has a huge problem with invasive carp. So the, the refuge over the years has done a lot of work to keep minimize the carp impacts on Mount Hare Lake. And that's a completely different story, but with this huge flood, the carp population exploded. And the site that the birds that um, were introduced to Mount Hare, they wintered at Mount Hare Lake, which I showed earlier. But when things got really cold, the harsh part of the winter, when Mount Hare Lake would freeze to 14 inches of ice and be down below zero for sometimes a month or so, uh, they would go to the the pond at headquarters, which had a huge spring that kept open water, and that's where they historically fed them. They actually quit feeding them in 1972, but the population still grew because they were able to feed around the lake uh, until the harsh time, and then they'd come to the pond, which had some pretty good aquatics in it, and, and sustained the flock. But when that flood came about, uh, carp invaded that winter site, that pond, and wiped out all the food, and, and so the swans drastically declined. In 1988, and uh, they they shifted their wintering site because it was a problem for 10 years, and uh, they shifted went to wintering 40 miles south near French Glen, which is at the south end of the refuge. And uh, when it's below zero down there, the only open water 
essentially there's a little water in the river which has almost no food in it. And there's a place called Five Mile Spring, which is on the West Canal along the highway down there that uh, when it's below zero, it keeps about an acre, or maybe an acre and a half of open water. So they went from a 20 acre um, wetland with lots of food in it to this one and a half acre site and they, they imprinted on that and they taught their young and that, that block at Nalhir has not moved in the South Hudson Valley. They haven't found Nalhir Lake even though after 1992 the conditions on the lake have been much improved most years. They haven't found their old historic wintering site and so it's been a challenge. Uh, this last year, or this, or this season, we, we had one pair start out and they tried to nest at Benson Pond on the refuge. And we have one other pair, which um, based on their banding records is a female-female pair. Um, the male from the pair that was nesting disappeared sometime in July. And so now we have three adult females based on what we think we know the sex is left at Malheur. So there's a high risk of the Malheur flock going extinct. I hope not too soon. Um, just to show you some of the flooding at Malheur Lake, the lake became the largest lake in Oregon, 171,000 surface acres during this flood and flooded out about 20 ranches around the lake. It was a disaster for a lot of things. Um, and this just shows you the, the biomass of carp after a rote known project on the lake and all those carp just basically outcompete everything else for the aquatic foods, including waterfowl, making it a biological desert for other species. Um, so this is the, the West Canal where, where Five Mile Spring is, and, and we had our swans trying to winter in this narrow channel, which is just, they're susceptible to predators. Uh, we had a couple, uh, one was seen killed by a bobcat in the canal one year, and anyway, not a great wintering site, and they're imprinted on that, and they haven't moved. Um, so Going back to my 1980s study, my partner John Cornelia used to be the refuge biologist. I came up as a volunteer and we started this neck collar study. And on the left is the late Steve Thompson, who was the assistant biologist uh, who helped with that. We marked 61 um, cygnets that hadn't fledged and nine adults during the study. And basically um, found that the survival was very low. The cygnets was slightly lower than um, the adults, you know, 0.44 is not a great annual survival rate. And 0.47 for adults is really low. And you could expect an adult trumpeter swan to be more like 0.8 or 0.9. Uh, so that's because during this study period uh, is when we had that uh, bottleneck, the birds left the Lake and uh, winter down in the woods and then the, the population dropped fast. So we already, oh, I did show this earlier, but um, so here's the flood effects here, and populations kind of come up and down, but this is the Blitzen Valley block now, and the carrying capacity down there is much lower, and we've got a lot of work to do to save that block. Uh, actually, we started working on that in 1988 because we saw that the numbers going down, and we knew they didn't have good habitat, and we were looking for, we knew their birds hadn't left the refuge, and they had all the birds that collared, only two left the basin. And one was shot in a swan hunt in Nevada, a tundra swan hunt, and the other one was went to California um, and then didn't make it back to the refuge. But most of them were sedentary, stuck on the refuge. And we we're trying to find a new winter site, and about 100 miles away is Summer Lake Wildlife Area, which is fed by the Anna River. And the Anna River is a giant warm water spring. It runs about 60 CFS, and the water's about 50 degrees. So it keeps a lot of open water. We were there. On February 3rd, when it was 32 below at now here, and it was something like 30 below when we were at Summer Lake, and there were about 1,200 tundra swans on Schoolhouse Lake, and we saw five trumpeters in this flock. And so we thought that would be a good site to have our mouth here for spend the winter if they could figure it out. Here's an aerial shot of Summer Lake. It's, the lake itself is a big salt playa lake, but there's very nice wetlands here at the north end. Um, it's about 18,000 acres of good habitat. So we started this program originally in 1991, and uh, because of some other issues, I won't go into the details, but um, they were gonna stop feeding at Red Rock Lakes Refuge, which was the stronghold historically, the original source of most of these swan stock. Uh, and they wanted to reduce the local flock there so there wouldn't be a big crash in the population that next winter when they stopped under feeding. So we were able to get 26 sub-adults from Red Rock Lakes. And, and also during these years, we moved, uh, 40 cygnets and sub-adults from now here 
discernment, like hoping to build this connection. But, and uh, um, it worked to some degree because we had uh, one pair of birds that we had released at Summer Lake about four years later came back uh, just south of Burns one day and they were seeing uh, most of the refuge. They didn't quite find the refuge, but uh, later that year they were nesting on the Crooked River in Oregon, about um, 60 miles north of Summer Lake. Um, anyway, they were able to move around quite a bit. Uh, this just shows we had during that original release program, which got stopped uh, because of a lawsuit. Um, we had eight new nest sites and we had bird summering where these green trees are in different areas around Oregon and even up into Washington around Toppenish, which is there's Toppenish National Wildlife Refuge there. There was a pair using that area for a few years. Uh, there was a lawsuit uh, where the Fund for Animals and a couple other groups sued the Fish and Wildlife Service over their general swan hunting in the West. And because of that lawsuit, Oregon Fish and Wildlife, which was a game agency, decided to stop the releases for the trumpeter swan program. And part of that lawsuit was petitioning the service to, excuse me, to list the Rocky, uh, Rocky Mountain population as endangered or threatened. And uh, so Oregon Fish and Wildlife did not want to be promoting a threatened species causing problems for potentially for landowners and stuff. So they stopped the program. It took a long while to settle that. We got going again on the program after the lawsuit was settled and um, did not change the general swan season, but it, um, we got going again in 2009. I just wanted to point out um, that moving signets from, from Mal here, we had some really interesting moves. Um, we had two, uh, three siblings that were released at Summer Lake and together they migrated down to Independence, California, which is Death Valley country, spent the winter there, came back to Summer Lake, and two years later, one of those females from that brood was nesting on the Sprague River um, uh, near Klamath Falls. And uh, these are just showing some other movements. We had one bird apparently joining the migration flock that goes through Utah, the Great Salt Lake country. It was seen there two different springs and seen in California on the wintering grounds. We've had birds uh, go up the west side in Oregon and show up uh, in BC around Vancouver, um, one up by Kamloops in interior BC. We had some interesting movements for these birds that didn't have their parents to teach them to be sedentary, which I think is pretty interesting. Uh, we got going again in 2009. This is a summary of our, um, our success, which has been kind of rocky. Um, we've got 36 adult birds as of last summer in this flock. And our goal is uh, to have 75 before we finish the program up and, and, and have 15, yes. So uh, basically, kind of add them up here. Um, this last year we had four nests. No, sorry, we had five nests. 36 adults. I just, another summary of some more recent um, movements of some of these, these signets that were released in yearlings. Um, Durham, California, we had several birds in Modoc County around Modoc National Wildlife Refuge, which is about 90 miles south of Summer Lake. We had a bird show up in Fairfield, Idaho, which is near Sun Valley, you know, east of Boise. Ty Valley in Northeast Oregon, Walton Lake, Oregon. Flathead Valley in Montana, we've had three different birds show up on the Flathead and join Dale Becker. Dale's on the call, hi Dale. Uh, join his flock, apparently. I hope those other two have been seen again. Um, one of them is, is a regular that's been seen the um, last couple of years up there in that country. And even in, that same bird was in Kimberly, BC. And um, we've had them in Washoe County, Nevada, which is south of Reno, um, Turnbull. So they're they're making these movements and kind of joining other areas like Turnbull and the Flathead Valley when there's a project. And we're hoping that these birds start building connections with those other flocks. This bird in red here, this 7 at 7, was an unbanded uh, yearling that was seen at Summer Lake um, in July 2018 and stayed there through March 2019. So the staff there, my partner Marty St. Louis, the manager, caught that bird up and put a collar on it to track it. To, Turned out it spent the next summer in Creston Valley, British Columbia, and we assume that's where it originally or, um, original origin was. And uh, it was back at Summer Lake this past February. So there's a connection between birds that are just north of the Panhandle in Idaho um, in that part of BC. There's a little flock of about 30 or 40 trumpeters up there that seem to be connected to 
our project down here in Oregon. Uh, since our recent releases, this just shows kind of the northern end of some of the birds. Um, I want to point out we had one bird, barely you can see here, that it was at Finley Refuge. And then it was up at Nanaimo in BC. This is last, last spring. Um, it was at Summer Lake in February. It was at Finley Refuge in March. It was at Summer Lake in April. It was at Finley Refuge in May. It was at Nanaimo in that area in um, late May. It was back at Finley in June and back at Summer Lake in, in July. Um, so they make some incredible movements. Um, it's interesting having all these birds kind of move into the core Rocky Mountain area around um, Flathead Valley, Trimble Refuge here. I want to talk about the uh, Trimble flock. They quit feeding uh, at Malheur and Trimble and Ruby Lake in 1972. And the Trimble had about, about 25 birds. Ruby Lake had about 25 birds at the time. And uh, their flock at Turnbull quickly went down to one in about three years. And, and uh, they had this one lone male that was alone at, at Turnbull Refuge for 20 years. And so they named him Solo. In 2006, all of a sudden Solo found a mate. And that spring they raised a brood. And the next spring they raised another brood. Following winter after that second year, uh, Solo was found dead of lead poisoning there in the refuge. Everybody was heartbroken, um, but the very next season, his wife found another mate. And so they've had this pair, and I'm not sure it's still the same pair, they're not marked, but um, a couple years later, they have a second pair there. That's probably some of the young from that pair. I hope was, they have some outside bird moving there as well, but um, there's been two pairs there off and on for the last, well, since about 2010. And uh, they, they haven't done great. The population doesn't seem to be growing, but you know, they're, there's still less than 12 birds in that general area, I think, and, and a pretty high risk of extinction like now here. Ruby Lake um, Refuge in Nevada, last time they talked to the books, they've got four or five trumpeters left and they haven't nested in the last three or four years. Uh, so that also high risk of extinction. Yellowstone National Park historically had about 30 trumpeter swan nests and uh, about six years ago or so, they were down to two and one of them, um, at Greed Lake, as I understand, uh, there's a bald eagle, that they, that they increased bald eagle population. A bald eagle moved into that lake and that was its territory and it was very good at catching cygnets. And so for, for several years, they had no production from that pair because of the bald eagle. And so the partners um, got together and put our heads together. We worked pretty close with the biologists there in the park on swan issues, the Swan Society does, but also the Wyoming Wetland Society has been working very closely on um, trying to salvage those eggs and, and they, they raise cygnets in captivity. And then, well, they, they don't raise them, they, they, they patch them and then put them back in the nest uh, to make sure their nest success is higher and then they still have some problems with eagles. And a lot of it is if there's disturbance, that lake is close to fishing, but sometimes people trespass and illegally go in there. And if the swans get disturbed by a fisherman, they quit guarding their cygnets and the eagles take them. So they've had some big issues there, but uh, they've been releasing um, Signets and yearlings around Yellowstone uh, for about 10 years now, and, and they're up to about six pairs this year. But uh, because of the COVID, there's very little survey. About four of them have failed for sure, but there may be two others that may have young. But um, um, I talked to Doug Smith, the biologist, and he, they just don't have data on them this year. But they're, you know, they're still struggling in Yellowstone um, to save the swans. It's mostly, it seems to be disturbance issues, maybe some habitat quality issues over time, too. So these are the current sites that have trumpeter swans in, in the mountain west. And I should point out um, the Flathead Reservation you know, started a project um, back in the early 90s and they've finished. Um, uh, they've done very well. I think they've got about 75 birds there. Uh, Dale, if you want to put your audio on and tell, uh, correct me. But anyway, they've got a healthy flock now and the Blackfoot Challenge uh, did their last release this spring and they're doing really well as well. So those areas are doing great. Turnbull's still struggling, now here's struggling. Uh, at the bottom of this, uh, on the right there, Seed Skitty National Wildlife Refuge, they've got a fairly healthy flock. Um, Yellowstone National Park in the middle of Madison and, and the refuges in the Southeast Idaho, including 
Grays Lake and Camas and Bear Lake have very small numbers of trumpeters and they are um, growing. Um, so anyway, we have a lot of work to do. There's still, these different flocks aren't well connected. So if there's a big issue in one area, they don't, they don't have flock memory about where to go in the landscape to find habitat somewhere else. And, um, that's an issue we're focusing on. This is a little side note. I'm almost done. Running low on time, but um, we, with my partners in Oregon Fish and Wildlife, we also started putting um, these GSM, there's Global System for Mobile Communications, GSM uh, radio collars on trumpeters at, at Summer Lake. And we focus so far the study on the birds that winter there because we, we see this big influx of trumpeters at Summer Lake um, in December. Uh, they move through in December and uh, they're pretty much, most of them move through and come back in early, they migrate pretty early, so they come back first or second week of February in these big numbers again. Um, we put one collar on in 2008, no, 2019, and this bird um, followed the orange line. No, let's see. Yeah, I didn't update this, the green line. It took the green line um, that next, that first spring to go, and ended up in, in uh, it ended up crossing the Rocky Mountains. It spent about two weeks in the Flathead Valley, the north end of Flathead Lake, and then crossed the Rockies, and then went up through Alberta near Grand Prairie, and ended up nesting just inside of BC near a little town called Tupper, pretty close to a lake called Swan Lake. And uh, it spent the summer there. It brought its, um, we saw it with its mate back at Summer Lake the next fall. It didn't take the exact same route back. It kind of swung down across Idaho and came back into Oregon pretty quick in the fall. In the spring, it ended up pretty much doing the same thing, um, a little different track, heading back to its breeding grounds. And this was this figure I have was cut off in April, early April, but it did end up back home. Unfortunately, that um, bird transmitter quit moving in mid-April, and we think we're pretty sure it died. It stopped moving completely. And I don't know whether it died of old age or predator or something, but it, anyway, it's it gets some very interesting data from these studies and. Uh, we've partnered up uh, with Oregon Fish and Wildlife on this one. We've helped pay for radios, um, Southeast Idaho refuges for some collars, and there's a big project going on in the Rocky Mountain group now. There's about 20 neck collars that um, are being, these GSM collars uh, being put on this year. Uh, this is some data from the birds that have been marked around Southeast Idaho last year. And I just also want to point out if you're interested in the interior population, there's a web page. I think they're going to have them up 70 to 100 just in collars put on birds in, in some of the um, Midwestern states. And I think maybe Manitoba is doing some as well. But um, there's, so there's going to be data available to look at this stuff. And we'll eventually try to work with our partners to get all this information so the public can enjoy it. But if you want to see um, the Midwest study, there's a link on our, if you go to the Trumper Swan Society.org the education and research tab, you, know, you can get to this information and, and there's a link you can click in and kind of get real-time data on what the birds are doing there in the Midwest. So getting back to the Western flocks, I'm going to summarize here. It's a high it's a strategic priority for the Trumpeter Swan Society to build a stable, uh, you know, uh, Western states Rocky Mountain flock. The extinction risk is very high for some sites. The isolation is contributing to this, and, and as I mentioned, their behavior contributes to the isolation because they're so sedentary. These birds that have, have generations of parents that have been sedentary. Um, overall, their status isn't good. Climate change is another issue. Um, generally, wetlands in the Intermountain West are drier than the, are getting drier and drier. So, the habitat quality um, it makes it more difficult for good production and their genetic diversity is very low. Um, one genetic study on trumpeters found that they had the lowest genetic diversity of any waterfowl species ever studied. So we're working with these with various partners to improve their connectivity, uh, build a meta population. And the meta population means that, you know, these little islands of habitat and the populations between those islands are connected at some level. In other words, Bob at, at Island B knows where George is at Island C and they can, if something happens, they're connected and, and can function as a bigger population than just these little local isolated flocks. We want to help them recover their former breeding range, which was they were pretty widespread historically. 
So we're, we're you know, our pr program here in Oregon has, has made some connections between these other locations, and we're hoping some of those groups survive and stick and, and start um, teaching other birds that, that join up with them for these migration routes to come into Oregon and connect with these other breeding sites. Um, we're going to continue to advocate for continuing restoration um, efforts until we get a stable base uh, and feel this population is secure, which per personally I don't think is currently. And lastly, make a pitch. If you want to support our Oregon um, Trumpeter Swan program, you can go to our swan society, trumpeter swan society org webpage and to the donate section. I think you might have to write in Oregon Project, but you can make a donation. If you want to support us in general, right now we have a campaign selling masks and you know, these nice swan conservationist uh, masks, which are 15 bucks a piece, and you can, they're on our main webpage right now. So if you uh, click on trumpeterswansociety.org, you should see it. There's two banners there, but if you wait a second, it'll, it'll show this, and you can click on it, and it'll take you to the link to purchase those. So with that, I'll end my talk, and I, um, we can try to answer some questions. Back to you, Janelle. Thanks, Gary. Let me get this back up here. Okay, so we have a couple questions in the chat. Um, Roger is wondering why they don't see trumpeter swans nesting in the Willamette Valley. They, they um, you know, we have this one female that's been over at Finley Refuge the last two years several times, and she may eventually find a mate and maybe they will be nesting there. But, you know, um, because they're so sedentary, they you know, we have this burgeoning small flock of 36 adult trumpeters counted based on last year's count. If they were enough around to pioneer the Willamette Valley, they probably potentially were there historically. But um, we just don't have a large flock in Oregon yet. And uh, once they fill up Summer Lake and some of the other wetlands around there, I would expect that this population starts taking off because Summer Lake, that block there doesn't have the winter bottleneck. They've got plenty of winter food there. Um, I would expect eventually they'll find the Willamette Valley. There are some private trumpeters that are roaming around the valley. There's one down near Elkton on the river, and there's one um, west of uh, Eugene up in the Boshia Reservoir or something, but those birds are stocked that somebody had private propagation and let their young free fly, and they may eventually find the Oregon flock and become part of the wild flock. Um, okay, that's great. Um, Carol suggested that we do a adopt a swan donation program to pay for GPS collars. Could you talk about the females that are on now here? Um, because I believe are all three collared. Yes, they are. Those three are marked. Yeah, um, and then Kurt suggest um, mentioned that you can actually um, sponsor trumpeter swan collars through the Trumpeter Swan Society. So that would be something worth looking into. Yes, yes, if you're interested. I think the collars are about $1,200 a piece. If I remember. But, um, they're not cheap, but if you've got money, we'll, we'll take it because you can always put it to good use and learn more. Yeah, that's great. Um, and here, for, for Malheur's purposes, there's possibility for partnering with Portland Audubon Society, which has adopted Benson Pond um, as a work area. And, um, you know, the work that they're doing there, occasionally we can help out and support. Um, so anytime that sort of partnership is happening, it'll be showcased in the newsletter and you can make contributions to our habitat enhancement um, donation portal. Um, David mentions that he lives on Whidbey Island, just north of Seattle, and there has been a single juvenile trumpeter in the wetlands along Cultus Bay Road since the fall. What's up with that? Well, I, you know, I, I can only speculate that it's probably an injured bird. Um, maybe a, a, little bit, a lot of times they'll get their wings injured on power lines, and so they're not very you know, strong flyers. If they've got a, a heel broken wing or something, that's what I would guess. Uh, you might talk to your local uh, Washington Fish and Wildlife biologist and learn to that, and maybe it needs some rehab. Um, so I don't really, you know, I don't really know why it's there, but it. It's not normal for them to be alone uh, by themselves in a spot like that. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, 
Kurt mentions that there are pairs on two sites in Maryland that have been there for close to a year, immature birds, but could they or would they end up breeding there? Are they establishing habitat? Possibly. They, they're probably, I would speculate that um, they may be from the Ontario program. Some of those birds have pioneered down into the States. I know there's some in New York. And, um, so it's, it's just, if they're there and are on territories, it, you know, they don't nest till they're four or five. So sometimes they'll occupy a territory for two or three years before they actually start laying eggs um, for the young pairs. So oh, I cross our fingers and hope they take. Okay, great, thank you. These were great questions, you guys. Does anyone else have a question before we kind of wrap up and I tell you what else is going on the rest of the week? Other things you might be interested in. Any other questions? Okay, well, something I'm gonna mention is that if you have questions about this topic or things occur to you later, this video is gonna be posted on Facebook and YouTube. So feel free to join in a conversation in the comments section of those posts um, or send us an email. And you know that could inspire a newsletter article in a future issue of the Malheur Musings newsletter. So um, don't be afraid to reach out. I do have two people have raised their hands. If you, I'm gonna unmute you to see if you have something to say. Dorothy, did you have anything you wanted to share? Or Eleanor. Eleanor, did you have a question for us? Okay. All right, well, if another question comes through. Okay. Eleanor, I am unmuting you. Go ahead. wonderful that's really exciting we have a book called um what is that how grace got her name uh, Gary uh, what, what she was referring to is the book the trumpet of the swan the trumpet of the swan and she was I need right. if anyone involved any of the scientists and doctors have ever read that before yes Okay. <laughs> awesome. You read it? Yes. <laughs> what? All right. Well, Eleanor is five years old, so uh, we were recommended by a friend to sign on. And thank you so much. You did a great job, everyone. Thank you so much, <laughs> Eleanor. I hope you enjoy your book. I will. Okay. <laughs> okay. And it's a chapter book. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay, signing off. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. <laughs> bye. Okay, guys, I am going to just share really quickly what's happening with the rest of the week. Um, I know a lot of you found out about Gary's talk today through the Trumpeter Swan Society, so you may or may not be linked in with the Friends of Malheur National Wildlife Refuge, but we have a lot of other great stuff happening this week. Um, tomorrow, Ken Kaufman is going to give a presentation on the principles and pitfalls of bird identification. And that evening, tomorrow evening, there's going to be a concert with Stephen Nance. It's a piano pop kind of concert. It's all bird themed lyrics. And the music's going to be really interactive. There's going to be a bingo sheet that participants will receive. Um, and there will be uh, prizes for folks as they participate in that. Um, Thursday, Gary's going to be back with us giving a presentation on sandhill cranes. And on Thursday evening, 
Our friends volunteer, Dan Streifer, who's been visiting the refuge for many years, has put together a presentation on how he birds Malheur and the region. Um, so it basically blocks up um, Harney County into these three regions and approaches how he goes birding throughout um, Harney County and Malheur Refuge. Um, the birds that he sees, when he expects to see them, and, and what he captures, full of really great photography. Ken Kaufman's gonna be back on Friday with a basic shorebird ID presentation. And then Friday night is gonna be trivia. And it's gonna be Malheur themed trivia with a little bit of friends um, presentations from throughout this week. There's gonna be some nuggets of um, information popped into some of the questions along with um, an audio round and a photo round. Saturday, is our last day of our events and it's going to be an auction Saturday evening. Lots of great items have been donated. You can find all this information on our website which is listed down here. Um, lots of sponsors, particularly from local businesses. We've been really fortunate to have the support of Portland Audubon, the Narrows RV and Restaurant, the Historic French Glen Hotel, Ords Museum and Gallery, um, Coffin Fields Guides, Wild Birds Unlimited from Ben and Steens Mountain Brewing, and in addition to a couple individuals who have donated art or heirlooms. Um, a couple examples of goodies that are up for auction are this bird nerd pack from Portland Audubon and a full set of Kaufman field guides. Um, so with that, Thank you all so much for supporting Malheur National Wildlife Refuge by being a part of our friends community, being here today and um, engaging with us. It's meant a lot and we really appreciate it.